tool as part of you know kind of what they were doing to kind of look at what this new system, you know, what the benefits of this new system has been. Sort of how has it, you know, have they have they had enough? It, there hasn't been enough time probably to have gone by at this point to really evaluate it. But I wanted to know if that was at least something that was kind of in the works um, with the with the Treasury, the South African Treasury. Yes, um, I believe. Well, let me let me tell you. First of all, the very first year, once we got the legislation passed, which was 2000, end of 2003, early 2004, then the implementation started, and this task group continued to work on designing how to implement and the transition, which was enormous. Sure. You know, it's it's uh, 11 million lives, uh, and close to well, well over a third of the budget of the country, and um, and so about six weeks out from the first budget where, where that transition was going to start. So like there was a year of, of planning after the passage of the legislation then it was going to start that next budget. Um, we went, oh my goodness, how are we going to know what's happening? And so I sat down. I mean, this is really embarrassing because I am not an expert in evaluation per se, sure. but I sat down with some people from the department and we came up with like 12 indicators that needed to be put in place by the nine provinces to start showing how things were changing. Uh, and you would have thought that we were asking for the moon. It just it was it was really something. And and honestly, we didn't get reports back on those. By the time I left, we still had not received any kind of uh, uh, systematic, consistent performance measuring or evaluation at all. There's their stated goal for it. Uh, Robert Clifton from here is not working specifically on right. that area, but he's trying to help develop uh, the whole concept of measurement and evaluation of, of uh, policy changes or budget changes. Let's talk to you a little more about that. Yeah. I've, I've been actually involved in some of that. Yeah. But, um, but I also, my comment, and that kind of is the perfect segue, is that maybe just if you have a few extra minutes just to talk a little bit more about the Office of Technical Assistance and, and your kind of, you know, the, the fact that this is a, an international program that you have, you know, there's resident advisors all over the world doing work yes. in budget and finance, et cetera. Yes. Why don't you go ahead? No. No, I know. <laughs> no, what she's, saying, what she's saying is that uh, the Office of Technical Assistance, which is this office that my friends were uh, recruiting me for uh, is a small unit in the uh, U.S. Treasury and it was set up originally when uh, the wall came down in Eastern Europe and we suddenly had, I don't remember, was it 12 or 15 brand new democracies out of the former Soviet Union and they all needed enormous amounts of help in setting up a whole new sets of, I mean, whole new governments basically. And so Treasury sent, they recruited people from around the country and sent people who I would call really budget people, which I do not consider myself to be, uh, you know, a, a solid, I mean, a, like a green eye shaped budget person. Uh, by any, you know, I understand budget systems, I've written budgets, I've administered budgets, I've, you know, fought budgets and whatever. But, but I mean really like people who can set up charts of accounts and things like that. And, uh, <coughs> So, the program now, it originally started in those Eastern European countries, and the program now, I, I'm trying to remember, I'm hesitating, but I think it's like 25 countries that there are resident advisors working in, and, and it's not just budget, it's budget, it's tax, it's financial institutions, uh, it's debt. Uh, financial institutions like setting up banking systems, things like that. I mean, when you stop and think about going from uh, a country that doesn't have any of that and suddenly overnight needing to have it, uh, the amount of technical assistance is, is amazing. But we're fairly unusual compared to other organizations that do a lot of technical assistance, and heaven knows there are many of them, and, and many of them do fine work. You know, IMF, World Bank, the OECD, lots and lots of groups, but but one thing that's unique about ours is that we go in and we live there and we stay there and we work in the building. And that makes a huge difference in terms of understanding and access and uh, building uh, 
building strong relationships, uh, the ability to identify things that they need that they don't even know to ask for, and then garner those resources to, to help uh, get people in to help. Because you're never going to be the, per the only person. I mean, you can always find other people who can come in who know more and can be more helpful. So uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's closed out of, of Eastern Europe about now. Um, and I think South Africa will be closing out fairly soon. I was supposed to be the last person, but um, because of a very specific request and because we knew somebody good to go over there, we, it extended. Um, but they're really moving to uh, Southeast Asia area, to Afri other parts of Africa, and to Central and South America. So um, they generally look for people who have a lot of experience. I mean, it's, it's something for you to think about you know, 15 years out. Or something like it, it still exists. Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, the the this uh, Hillary Clinton task force. Mm -hmm. and two, and this is two parts. You know, that one there was the secrecy, and everybody got all bent out of shape about it. <clears throat> and but then, you know, here you come along. Uh, I don't know how much later? Ten years later, and the vice president has a secret task force on energy and. And his deliberations were able to be kept secret. So, I, I, that to me, it's just I don't understand that. But maybe the people, the composition of the Supreme Court—I <coughs> don't know how it changed. But you know, he was able to keep his deliberations secret. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, nowadays the—I uh, uh, don't know if that's a comment or something—but the the uh, I read a recent column by David Brooks, uh, New York Times columnist. He's conservative, and and he was saying that. You know, the Republicans used to have a certain way of thinking. They looked out for the common man. He was talking about uh, Abraham Lincoln. But nowadays they're talking about, you know, free trade. And he says they've sort of missed the middle class. And he said the person who's really addressing these sorts of issues is uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, and, and I think, I know for myself, me personally, I spend, in addition to my state of Texas health insurance, I take an extra five thousand dollars a year out uh, through a PayFlex account, and I spend all that money every year for health insurance for my family. And I think for a lot of Americans, that's a huge issue. And you know, I think she's, you know, basically the one candidate who's sort of uh, primed on the issue. Uh, uh, really, I'm just. Uh, that's a comment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a comment, not a question. Yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not an attorney. I do remember there was quite a bit of, of discussion back under hers about uh, concerns of the legality of the committee, and, and actually some legal action was was begun about it. I frankly cannot remember what happened, because basically we came out with a plan, and uh, I think it just kind of got pushed aside. But I, I, I think she made a, a terrific mistake, which I think she's learned from, but the, she made a huge mistake in the way that going about that committee. First and foremost, it was a completely Democratic committee in terms of members from Congress. There were no Republicans on it. it and that's, that's cr I mean, it, it, I just still just shake my head about that. You know, I, I can't, you, get, you had very, very good senators and, and some very good House members who were knowledgeable about, this, about the issue and, and and who wanted to see something happen, positive. Bob Dole was one of them. And he ended up being, probably he and Newt Gingrich were the two that helped really kill them, make sure that the plan was really killed. Um, and I think if, she had, if they'd taken a different tack towards them from the beginning, not necessarily Gingrich, but certainly Dole, who had been chair of the Senate Finance Committee. I mean, you know, he, he's a smart man. He knows his stuff. Um, that was a mistake that there was, I think there was one medical doctor on the whole committee. Wow. So let's make all the AMA doctors mad from the get-go. Um, and, and so those were kind of strategic, you know, the size of it was ridiculous. Um, and if that meant I wouldn't be on it, although of course our role was slightly different again because her whole, the whole plan was set up for the states to run the system, states administer the system. So they had to have some reading on what the states could do. Uh, 
but regardless, it was uh, unwieldy. It was well organized, I must say. It, it was for having so many moving parts. This toll gate process was a pretty interesting process for it to go through. 